So today we're talking about the Great Wall of China. This is going to be a fairly simple talk because it's a fairly straightforward uh, discussion about the Great Wall. Um, and if you missed any of these talks, they will be available. I'm going to put the website up at the end of the talk. Don't let me forget that. Um, in terms of where you can find the videos. The videos from these, these uh, voyages will be up in May, but then there's a lot of other uh, various lectures that we've done on world religions and all kinds of things in the Middle East and Indian Ocean and whatnot that, that are available on our website. The Great Wall of China. This is the kind of image that almost everyone has when they think of the Great Wall of China because this is the, the calendar pictures. Uh, this is what is always captured, except usually there's a few more people there, and in reality those of you who go there are going to find out there are a lot more people uh, there. The Great Wall is one of the most popular sites ever. Uh, it's been called one of the wonders of the world. It's considered uh, perhaps the most ambitious construction project ever in the history of humanity. In its total length, the uh, Great Wall of China was over 13,000 miles long. 13,170.7, I think is the exact, because they actually had a commission that, that tried to figure out how long it was. Um, with the Great Wall of China, because it was intended primarily for defense, but it was also used for controlling imports and exports, so that they made sure they got their duties. Since they had to go through passes in the wall, they were able to control it. <coughs> Controlled immigration. Um, it, it served various other kinds of purposes because there was trade occurring between China, uh, particularly Han China, but various of the dynasties of China and some of the uh, nomadic peoples that lived in the north, they would actually, some of the forts along the way would serve as trading posts. And that's where the people would gather in order to make trades. While this is most of what you think of uh, when you, and those of you who go to visit the Great Wall uh, when we were in Beijing, will see something probably very similar to this. One fourth of the Great Wall is actually made up of natural barriers. They would use rivers or cliffs, uh, steep mountains, in order to not have to build the wall through that section. And so that would serve as the barrier, the defensive barrier that they were looking for. Um, at this point, they estimate that probably, uh, se well, 70% of the wall was constructed. It was built, but they estimate at this point that about one third of what was originally part of the Great Wall has now disappeared. Um, there were various construction techniques, while when you see this kind of stonework, cut stone, this is entirely the work of the Ming Dynasty, the last dynasty that really contributed significantly to the wall, or contributed at all. The only other dynasty after the Ming Dynasty was the Qing Dynasty, and they didn't do anything to the wall. In fact, they forbade it. Um, and so, but about a, th a third of the wall has disappeared at this point because a lot of it is built out of a very different technique than this. The Great Wall is so long, there are places where it runs through mountains, like this appears, even steeper mountains, and there are places where it crosses the desert. Well, clearly the materials that were available for building all, over all this different kind of terrain were very different. So whereas the Ming Dynasty used cut stone, because they were able to do that, there were many places that they would use adobe bricks that they then uh, to form outside walls and then use packed earth in between. There were places that they would create uh, woven baskets that they would fill with sand and gravel, which is kind of the only material they had, stack those up and then soak them with seawater to try to compact the materials. Interestingly, some of those walls are still around. So there were a lot of different techniques that they used for creating the barrier that is the Great Wall in various places. And because some of them are not nearly as long lasting as others and have been there longer, um, some of them have completely just melted away into the, the uh, natural terrain. The most common myth about the Great Wall is that you can see it from space. You cannot see it from space. <laughs> not with the uh, unaided eye. Um, do you see the Great Wall in this, uh, in this picture? No, you don't. <laughs> this is a river. <laughs> The Great Wall starts down here and comes up and crosses from the lower left to the upper right. There are places you might be able to see there. This is actually a, a magnified image that, that they use. Uh, I think it crosses right there. I've studied this picture up close. This is a seven uh, mile square image. So with 
radar imagery and with magnified imagery from space, yes, they can pick it up. But trying to see the Great Wall of China from with the naked eye would be the equivalent of trying to see a human hair with the naked eye from two miles away. Can't do it. Um, the Going all the way back to the 17th century, 17th century, 18th century, even into the early 20th century, long before we had uh, travel to the moon, people were saying you could see the Great Wall of China from the moon. Even the Guinness, in the 1920s, the Guinness book, uh, you know, of, of strange anomalies and all kinds of things, they claimed that you could see the Great Wall of China from the moon. No, you can't. So the next time you go into space, <laughs> you can try, but you will not be able to see it. Neil Armstrong and others have said, no, there's no way that you can see that. Um, but they have used various kinds of magnifying devices from up there and have been able to detect. It, it, you have to know exactly where to look. Not only, I mean, the, the, the widest point of the Great Wall is 39 feet. It averages 23 to 26 feet wide. So um, if you think about that and figure that it's also the same color as all of the surrounding territory, almost everywhere. There are some places that you have gray stone in the middle of forest, but for the most part, you know, it'd be difficult enough to see from much closer than space. Uh, but that's just one of the rumors that you hear. I think one place that you might be able to see it is right there. The, um, the primary reason, as I said earlier, for the Great Wall was to provide protection from various of the nomadic tribes mm -hmm. in the north, but it also was very useful as a transportation route because they would travel along the wall or in some places travel alongside the wall. They put together, um, put together a route that people could travel in that, but it did, uh, along the way they would have watchtowers, they would have uh, troop barracks, garrison station, signal towers. Um, they also would have these uh, towers that would hang over the wall. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, as a historian, you have to think about these things, that if you have a flat wall, like a, a castle wall or a defensive wall, and people make it to the wall, it's very hard to shoot them, okay? It's very hard to do anything about it unless they try to climb with a ladder or something. That's why later on in medieval fortresses and fortresses in Europe, they would make star-shaped fortresses because that meant that you had access to be able to shoot at people who got to the base of the wall. Well, the same thing was true with the Great Wall. Every thing, uh, several sections, every 300 meters, they will have a tower, a defensive tower, that will hang out over the wall itself so that if somebody got to the base of the wall and was trying to climb up, they could get out and shoot at them. So there are all sorts of different constructions along there. Um, the very earliest part of the wall actually was built um, in my description, I said it began with the first emperor. Um, I still think this may be Morse code. Uh, the, there's somebody stuck in the hole and they're touching wires together to let us know. I don't know why the lights are flickering on and off like that. Um, the, it, it actually wasn't the first emperor, uh, Qing Shi Wan Di, uh, who started the wall. He was the first one that kind of connected it all. But even prior to that, during the period of time known as the Warring States period, or the spring and autumn period that led to the Warring States period. This was the end of the Zhou Dynasty before the uh, first imperial dynasty, the first guy who, who united enough of it to call himself emperor. And they had begun having short walls to defend against the various Warring States. There were six major states that were fighting against each other. Well, when, uh, in fact, I'll put this slide up first. These, um, the pre-Warring States, we had a, the first fellow, uh, the Duke of the Qi State, comes along and he begins to build walls to protect himself from the Wu State and from the Chu State. There were six warring states during this period of time. Um, the warring states, all six of them, were subdued and incorporated by the Qin Dynasty, the very first official emperor, the uh, Qin Shi Wang Di, that, that you remember, Qi, you know, Shi Wang Di. I talked about him a lot in the history. Uh, and he combined all of those states and then he took the pieces of wall that they had built and he connected them into what he called the long wall and that's the first uh, sort of formal effort to try to create a, a great wall barrier he was primarily concerned about protecting against from the Mongols which were later on the uh, Zhongnu and the Huizi and others were sort of Mongol nomadic tribes and also from the Manchus up in Manchuria 
Uh, following him, the Han Dynasty immediately followed the Qin Dynasty, and the Han Dynasty were uh, built more of the wall um, than anybody except the Ming. They extended the wall all the way up um, to protect the Gansu Quarter, to protect the Silk Roads that we talked about. And so they were very concerned about protecting the sort of entrance and exit from China, and they used the extension of the Great Wall to do that. We then get the Ming Dynasty, which built most of what you think of and see as the wall today, the stone, cut stone walls. Um, the Qing Dynasty, the last dynasty, not only didn't add to the wall, they forbade it. And then we have, uh, beginning in the 1900s, 1949, the modern times, the People's Republic of China, Communist China, during the Cultural Revolution period, unfortunately, um, one of the themes of the Cultural Revolution was to, was to not sort of stop focusing on the past, look to the future, uh, and think about the, the great communist future that, that Chairman Mao had projected. And in the process, they destroyed a lot of historical uh, sites and artifacts. And some of that was they actually took apart part of the Great Wall to use the stones to build houses and public buildings. So um, that's something they've sort of repented of at this point, I believe. So the first of sections of the wall are called the Qi um, Wall. And it wasn't called the Great Wall yet, but it was a pretty good wall. Qi <laughs> was one of those six warring states. It existed between 650 and 722 uh, during the spring and autumn period, warring states period. And so they built sections of wall that were kind of broken up. Then we have the primary, um, the part of it that we think of as being really the start of the Great Wall as it exists today was under the Qin Dynasty, Emperor uh, Qin Shi Huangdi. And he is the, not only was he great about building the wall, he is the one that built this massive mausoleum that some of you have undoubtedly visited, the Terracotta Warriors, the first official emperor. He also built major canals, he introduced major irrigation systems, but he was the one that was pretty hardcore. You know, he used legalism as the system to control the country, and he was not very popular. And so his <coughs> dynasty, the first formal imperial dynasty of China, only lasted 15 years. Um, after his death, his son tried to take over and run things that didn't work very well, and so it was only a 15-year dynasty. But in that 15 years, he got a lot done. And so he extended the walls. Now, Another thing, too, that people misunderstand is they think the wall is one straight line, or even one crooked line. It's not. At various times, there have been double sections of wall. There have been walls that curved, walls that overlapped one another in different ways. It's never been just one wall that was intended to separate two distinct areas. It's often gone in different, you know, different directions and various tangents off of the central wall because there were various tribes, various groups that they were defending against in various places. And sometimes it also had to do with the terrain, you know, where you could uh, or most likely could build a defensive wall that would take advantage of the terrain. Following the Qin Dynasty, we have the Han Dynasty, which lasted about 400 years, roughly 200 BC to 200 AD. The Han Dynasty were the ones I talked about this morning, the ones that launched the Silk Road um, efforts that really expanded the connection between China and the rest of the world. And the Great Wall was one of the ways that they protected the trade, the merchandise that was traveling on the Silk Road from the Xiongnu and from other of the, uh, the nomadic military uh, mounted nomads in the north that were always anxious to trade, but when they couldn't trade or just didn't feel like trading, they would raid. And so Han, the Han Dynasty built a massive wall. Um, the, they created over 8,000 kilometers of wall in the 400 year period, and they spent a lot of time on it. It wasn't a short kind of construction period. Um, they estimate that as many as a million men were involved in constructing the wall. Many of them were soldiers, some were prisoners of war, some were convicts. Others were just forced conscripts, that they would force uh, local people from the country to work on public projects. That was true of pretty much all of these. But the, um, the particular section of the wall here, from uh, Lan Lanzhou up to um, Dunhuang and further, this was the Ganzu Corridor that I talked about, or the Hexi Corridor, that led up and from up here 
at Nam Long, the, uh, the road splits and there were three different routes that were really the entrance routes to the Silk Road, um, the Silk Road traffic areas that they would go around the Tarim Basin or up the north going to the Black Sea. So the Great Wall was very important to them because it had protected their trade. Um, even though the Xiongnu, as they, got fat, as they got stronger, they ended up being able to break through the wall in a number of places. The Ming Dynasty was responsible for almost 9,000 kilometers. And when you think of the Great Wall today, you think of the Ming Dynasty Wall, because it was the sections, uh, the long sections that were built out of cut stone. That's what you're going to see. Now they have only been around, the Ming Dynasty was up to 1644, so we're talking about only a little less than 400 years. Most of those sections um, have been around, four to 500 years. They extended it greatly all the way from, um, and by the way, you see Beijing there and Tianjin, where we're going to be landing. Uh, up to Beijing, there are, they went all the way from the, the sea and connected sections of the wall. You'll see there are places where there's double wall, that there are uh, circular walls, and they carried all the way up still again, almost to Dunhuang in terms of what the Ming Dynasty had been responsible for. So a massive effort by the Ming to build these walls. They were primarily concerned about two groups, the Mongols in the north, and remember, it was uh, the Han Dynasty, predecessors to the Ming, that had suffered so much from the Xiongnu and from the others. So the Ming were trying to keep the Mongols out, and they were trying to keep the Manchus out. Interestingly, the dynasty right before the Ming Dynasty was the Wan Dynasty under Kublai Khan. They were Mongols, and they had been forced north, and they still lived up north, and they were always wanting to come back and attack, attack and take China again. So they were defending against them, and then the Manchus, or Yurkins as they were called, up in Manchuria, they, they became, they eventually did conquer the Ming Dynasty and they became the Qing Dynasty. The Qing Dynasty was not uh, Han Chinese. It was made up of what it, most Chinese thought of as foreigners, Manchus. So the two great enemies that the Ming built the wall for, one of them had been the previous dynasty and one of them ended up later being the following dynasty. So they had good reason for wanting to protect against this stuff. Along the way, as I mentioned, there are three main kinds of uh, components that you will see to the wall. There is the wall sections themselves. There are the watchtowers, um, or some in places, some of those watchtowers turn into significant fortresses. And then there are signal towers. They had a system along the Great Wall where they could communicate if an enemy was spotted or uh, if, if there was some need for them to let people down the line, particularly on top of hills, they had signal towers. And this is what those signal towers, the biggest of them, looked like. The signal towers were designed that they could, during the daytime, they could um, flash banners to signal. They also would keep large quantities of um, wolf manure. I don't know exactly how you would gather a large quantity of wolf manure. But the reason they used it is because dried wolf manure, when you burn it, gets off a lot of smoke. Who knew? <laughs> so they would, if, during the daytime, if they needed to signal, they would set fire to this wolf manure and give off an enormous cloud of smoke, and that was how they would signal. At night, they would have a gathering of, of wood, and they could set large bonfires. And so they have fire uh, signals from tower to tower. And the idea was, in order to communicate to everybody along the defensive wall, they would, if somebody set off one of these um, fires at night or, you know, set light to the wolf manure, uh, wolf dung during the day, then each of the towers along the way would see that and they would pass that so that they could communicate for a great distance along the wall that there was an enemy approaching or that there was some reason they needed to have concern. So you will, if you visit the wall, you will see this kind of structure, which were their, um, their be they're sometimes called beacon towers or um, the signal towers. Along the way, there are a number of places where they had major fortresses. These were called passes because these were the only places there were openings that people could go in and out. On the maps that I showed you of the Gansu Corridor, of the Silk Road, the various town names are along the wall um, are locations where you have this kind of facility. They tended to be three stories tall. There was the ability there to um, 
There were ramps that would go up to a major upper level for not only soldiers but horses. There were huge wooden doors here that could be sealed up. But again, this was how they controlled trade coming in, how immigrants were controlled, various other ways in which they were able to maintain control of their borders at that point. And so you will see these kinds of fortresses in several places along the way. Uh, here's another example of one. Um, this, this particular one, uh, because it was along a dividing area between the, the Mongols in the north, the nomadic tribes, the, the Chinese always referred to their own country as the Middle Kingdom. What that meant to them is they were the center of the world. You know, they were the center of the universe, and they considered the emperor to be the king un under all of heaven. So this is an example where you've got a fortress here, or a pass, and the sign, uh, the uh, indicator here, the sign is the first pass under heaven, which means this is the first place after you get out of the barbaric nomad territories that you actually enter under heaven, into civilization. Um, and so, again, large doors, that was how people passed in and out between them. And they would have, at, at these fortresses and in many of the watchtowers as well, they would have barracks. Soldiers would be assigned there. They would live there. They had stores so that they could maintain food and water. Um, they, it, these were military outposts that the military could remain there and take care of uh, protecting the area through it. Now, many parts of the wall have suffered from neglect. As I mentioned, during the Cultural Revolution, they actually disassembled part of it uh, because the whole theme of the Cultural Revolution is not having, not paying a lot of attention, not having a special regard for the past, but rather to look just to the future. Um, it didn't work very well. And so later on, after Mao died, there were major trials for the Gang of Four and others who were responsible for leading the Cultural Revolution. So they did sort of repent from that idea. But the, the destruction of the wall by natural, um, just decay, the fact that in many places it's melted back into the earth because it wasn't made from stone. Other places where there was stone or even adobe brick, some of those have been disassembled. But then in more recent times, recognizing the, uh, the potential for the Great Wall as a tourist attraction, as, as also part of the history of China that they can be proud of. Duang this morning was saying that in China these days, everything has to be the biggest. Carolyn and I looked around at each other and said, sounds like Dubai. You know, Dubai, they're going to have the tallest, fastest, richest, whatever. Well, in China, part of their national pride right now is they do have, you know, amongst the largest cities, the largest um, electro hydraulic dam, uh, hydroelectric dam, and various other kinds of things. Well, they began to realize that having the one of the largest construction projects in all history, this extraordinary wall was uh, a mat should be a matter of national pride and rightly so you know there, there's never been anything quite like it and so they now they have rebuilt parts of it even as recently as 2000 they have rebuilt sections maybe some of the sections you'll be going to but they try to rebuild them accurately to what they were previously so that people can get a good idea what the great wall would have been like when it was first built or in its heyday when it really was a critical part of the protective border between the uh, Chinese people and, and those outside the Middle Kingdom. So tomorrow you're going to see examples of, you know, again, that look like this, um, except with a bazillion people on them. Um, because it is obviously very, very popular. You know, I would love to go to the Great, I, I've never been to the Great Wall. I would love to go. Carol and I had to choose between the Forbidden City and the Great Wall. And even though it's a Great Wall, you know, I think there is probably, you know, for, for me, there's more at the Forbidden City that I was interested in seeing. So um, maybe we can figure out a way the second day that we can, you know, uh, hitch a ride up there or something. We'll figure it out. But uh, anyway, I want to put one more thing up. This is, I should have made it lighter. This is the website again, www.litchapala, L-I-T-C-H-A-P-A-L-A.org. That's the website where the videos are available free of charge and all the PowerPoints and everything else if you want to see any of that, either from, from these cruises or from previous. And this is my name. Oops. Boy, I need to get a smaller thumb. Um, <laughs> my name and my email address, rda at rossarnold.net. No breaks or underlines or anything like that. If you have trouble getting on the website or if you have questions, if I can help you in any way, 
please let me know. Uh, Carolyn and I, as I say, are going to be doing five cruises now. Starting in July, we are going to be in Western Europe. We pick up in Copenhagen and we'll be doing various trips around the Baltic Sea, Western Europe, around the British Isles, and then up uh, the west coast of Norway and all the way up to the Arctic Circle, which is the first time they've done that. Um, and we'd love to be able to see, I mean, there are some people here, Paul and uh, Natalie and others, we've been on, I don't know, 30 cruises together. It's, <laughs> it's hard to say, no, uh, several. And so it's always wonderful to see faces, you know, um, uh, Larry and Jean and others that are on board here. So it's great to see people again. It is my honor to be able to come and do this. Um, I, I enjoy it and am always flattered by the fact that you all choose to come. So thank you very much for coming to the lectures. Let, let me know if you have any questions.